Hey, it's Seth Godin. In the summer of 2012, I had an amazing opportunity to spend three days with a group of extremely motivated entrepreneurs, people right at the beginning of building their project, launching their organization. During those three days, I took them on a guided tour of some of the questions they were going to have to wrestle with, some of the difficult places they were going to just stand up and say, this is me, this is what I'm making. I'm sorry you couldn't be there, but I hope this is the next best thing. Excerpts from the live event, unrehearsed, no slides. Here it is. Enjoy it. But even more important, I hope you do something with it. Thanks for listening. Now, back to this funnel, because it's one of my favorite drawings. And then I'm going to draw the Rogers curve. Remind me if I forget. So, do you all know how Google makes billions of dollars every month in profit? Right? Those little ads next to the search results. Do you know how they price the ads? What? You pay by the click. But how do they decide how much a click costs? It's an auction. Okay. So, this is unbelievably brilliant. The what, what they did. And Bill Gross uh, sort of invented it and then uh, Google figured out how to maximize it. Here's all the people who are searching for something. Okay, And I run an ad saying, uh, let's say that there's a side effect of Viagra that's discovered that um, makes you your ears get bigger. Okay? So... I buy an ad on Google that says, ears getting bigger? Click here to join our lawsuit. And I put it up next to the word Viagra. Now that's going to cost me $8 a click. Let's say 5% of the people who see this ad click on it. Okay? I only have to pay $8 for each one. They come to my website right here. How much does it cost to get that person to my website? It's going to get harder. $8. Let's say one out of 10 people who see that click on the next page to learn more about my firm. How much does it cost me to get someone here? 80 Does anyone not understand why it's 80 This is really important. Okay. Right. So, for, right. so I have to multiply by 10. Yes? Okay. And now let's say one out of five of those people give me their email address so I can follow up with them. How much does it cost me to get an email address? 400? And let's say that I email people the newsletter, blah, 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 and one out of ten of them join my class action lawsuit with the big year problem. How much does it cost me to get every client? $4,000. That's how much it costs me to make a sale using this thing. Now, if I succeed in my case against Pfizer, I'm going to make $100,000 per person in profit because that's how much my legal fees will be, which is great. Um, so clearly, I should buy as many of these people as I can for $4,000 because my revenue from each one is $100,000. Do you see why? Make sense? Okay. Right, so we could, instead of me picking a big lawsuit, I could pick, I'm selling the melon of the month club, right? The, the math still works. So now, someone else sees what I'm doing and goes to Google and says, I'm going to pay $16 a click. If the cost of a click goes up to $16, what's my cost of a sale go to? How much, Terry? More. How much more? You're in the liberal arts section back there. <laughs> the, ans the answer is it, this doubled, so this doubles. That's all you have to know. Right? Now this is magic because who's taking all the profit off the table? Because I'm willing to keep in the bidding war until I get to $99,000. I'll just keep paying more and more and more because it's worth it to me. So all the profit goes to the auction. 
Google is just clearing the board in every single industry that does online anything because they get to keep the money. With me? Now, if your competitor realizes that you don't need two pages to get someone's email address, but only one page, they're going to be five times more efficient than you are at running this funnel. So their cost of a sale is going down by 80%. See why? So suddenly they can bid a fortune for these links. You can't afford them anymore. And they're going to get all the customers. Now this funnel is exactly the same thing that happens if you have a sales force. And it's exactly the same thing that happens if you run ads in magazines. And exactly the same thing that happens if you're buying shelf space from Whole Foods. In every case, there's an amount of money you're willing to pay to get the attention of the masses. And there's an amount of money you get at the bottom for the cost of making a sale. So I'm going to let this one sink in for a minute because this is going to transform the magic. Because one of the things entrepreneurs do is we believe in magic and we say, I'm going to build this great thing and then a miracle happens and I'm rich. And it's the, <laughs> and then a miracle happens part that I'm concerned with. So Kit needs to reach tourists, mostly, who are coming to Miami so that they will pay her, what's the average person, 50 bucks? $125 to use some of her services that she offers tours and Vespas and things like that. And the only reason that she doesn't have a million customers is she can't figure out an efficient funnel to get in front of a tourist on the right day with the right story so that that tourist then lets, listens to her story again and then comes to her facility and hands over their $125. And if you fix this problem, everything else will take care of itself. And so when we think about the business, we say, well, how do I change not the funnel, but the business itself so that it makes it more likely that my funnel gets more efficient? So if I think about, uh, you may have seen these tours they have in various cities where they use old World War II uh, amphibious boats. And so they drive through the city and then it hits the river and it drives in the river as a boat. And what they they call them duck tours and they give everyone on the boat this really annoying duck noise thing. <laughs> Why would you do that? Ducks are, duck noise machines are expensive. And the answer is because what are tourists doing? They're walking around. Well, while they're walking around, this boatload with wheels of happy tourists quacking like ducks goes by. So the act of running their business is also making their funnel better. Because right on the side of the boat is their phone number and that is the only method they need to get more tourists to get on the next boat is the act of doing it in front of them. Right? So when I think about Hans and his thing, a lot of the time that these guys are out there with their pitch, they're doing it to someone who might become his next customer. Or the guy who runs Fancy Fortune Cookies, a business out of, uh, I think, Georgia, number one cookie manu fortune cookie maker in America, will make you fortune cookies for your company event, blah, blah, blah. Well, the number one way for him to grow would be to offer a discount if you were willing to let him put his URL on the back of the fortune. Because every single person who's at an event opens it up, oh, that's clever, and they see on the back how to order fortune cookies for their event. So again, short-circuiting the funnel as it grows. So this is the bell curve, the normal distribution. So for the liberal arts in the back row, liberal artists, if I asked all of you to get in height order from four foot to seven foot, and I measured, what I would see is a couple people who weren't very tall, a couple people who were very tall, and most of you in the middle. If I organized any group of people I meet on the street by hair length or uh, their, the number of CDs they own, it would be exactly the same. There'd be a whole bunch of people who own one CD, not very many, a few who own 10,000 CDs, and most people in the middle. This distributes for almost everything in nature. Okay. Well, if we talk about worldviews, it turns out that we always distribute in the following way. There are a few people who like to buy stuff merely because it's new. These are the people who used to watch all their TV on a TiVo, but now watch it on an iPad instead because it's cooler. 
Then there are these people who waited till a DVD player was 80 bucks at Walmart before they bought one. They're the masses. There's a lot of them. And then there are these people who still have a 12 flashing on their VCR. <laughs> if we think about the market for shoes, these are women who read Vogue magazine for the ads. And these are people who buy six pairs of New Balance at a time and then don't go back to Zappos for six more years. Right? And you have to think really hard in the group you are thinking about is are you selling a product that's going to appeal to early adopters because it's new? Or are you selling something that's going to appeal to people who only buy when they have to because everyone has it? Or are you trying to appeal to the masses? These are fundamentally group, different groups of people. And th this is where technology people got in trouble for a long time, which is there was this theory that the Boston Consulting Group put out there, which is that you would make something for the geeks, and then as you made it more and more, it would get cheaper to make, because that's what happens with digital goods, and it would become more popular, so you could just ride your way to the masses. And that happens once in a very long while, but not often. And the reason is because between here and here, is a chasm, a big gap. And this chasm is because these people want something that's cool and these people want something that works. So if we think about uh, the typical app on the iPhone or the iPad, there's a bunch of people who buy it right away because it's cool, but these people don't want to hear about that. They want to hear a completely different story, that it is a complete solution that has nothing to do with cool. And that gap, the chasm, is in a book by Jeff Moore called Crossing the Chasm, and it's where a lot of you will get into trouble. So what you have to think about is, am I happy being a small enough business or a freelancer that all I need is a few early adopters and I can declare victory? Or am I building something for the masses and it doesn't work until I have the masses? Right, so if we look at, uh, if you read TechCrunch and all those other online blogs, they are entranced by new cutting-edge businesses. Like, did you see that one that got $40 million in funding called Color or Colors? It's this big thing, all the one million people who tried the new thing, there's one million of them, all got it. And then it completely failed down to zero. A company that raised $40 million had to start over, and they're on their third try now, because it doesn't work unless they have 10 million, 20 million users. So it doesn't do them any good to come up with something hip they had to come up with something that everyone was using. Let's say it's 20 years ago, and you are one of the few people who moved here from Thailand who can actually cook really well in some sort of volume. And you look around and you say, there are no good Thai restaurants in New York City of all places. There ought to be a lot of them. So the instinct of the entrepreneur is, all right, great, this is better Thai food, I'll win. But that's not the way it works. So I want to take you through uh, Mrs. Shripify's thinking and how it came to be that her restaurant makes millions and millions of dollars now in Queens, way off the beaten path on the 7 train, and how she got there. So how, first of all, does someone like me, a customer she needs because I'm willing to drive to Queens to have uh, jungle curry. How does someone like me find out that this restaurant even exists? How does you use tribes and early adopter thinking and cost of sales to grow a little tiny restaurant li that literally only had four tables the first few years she was open to one that's now eight times the size with a patio in the back and another branch still closed on Wednesdays uh, a few miles away. Right, so it starts with this. In this distribution of people in New York who go out to eat, there's a group here that want to go to places that haven't been in the New York Times yet. And this group was organized by a guy named Jim Leff and Jim started a website called chowhound.com. And chowhound.com was the tribal watering hole for people who wanted to give each other the buzz on something that was new. Now, at its peak, 
300,000 people a month use Chow Hound, of which probably half were in New York City, and of the half, 150,000, probably only 50,000 were interested in Thai food, and of the 50,000, probably only 10,000 were going to go to Queens. So there were only 10,000 people who mattered to Mrs. Shripify, other than her tiny community of Thai people, but she couldn't make the business work at the level she wanted if it was just for Thai people. So instead of doing what every other Thai restaurant does, which is, we have Pad Thai, come here, she said, we don't have Pad Thai, and if you're not one of the 10,000 people, you're probably not going to like this place. That we're going to serve uh, stinky long beans, and we're going to have crispy watercress salad, but we're not even going to put it on the menu, because you, you're an insider or you're not. And if you're an insider, you're welcome here. So by making the perfect restaurant for these 10,000 people, what she did was she made it irresistible to these 10,000 people. Because there was no place else to go. She had a monopoly on interesting Thai food in New York City 20 years ago, 15 years ago. So what happens? Well, it turns out that chow hounds talk a lot. And it turns out when you go out to dinner, you rarely go by yourself. So you bring other people with you. And some of the people you bring with you don't like it. That goes against everything most entrepreneurs stand for. Fine with her. If you don't like it, don't come back. But if you do like it, I have a monopoly on this for a while, for this group, before you get bored. You're going to have to come back. At that point... Someone from the New York Times who's trying to please his boss by writing about something that hasn't been written about before steals some of the insight from the chow hound people and goes to the restaurant. And he writes a two-star review of a restaurant where it's not very expensive and there are no tablecloths. This is very unusual in New York. This was an important thing. It was a spin of the wheel. Didn't have to happen, but it did happen, right? And so... When the New York Times gives it two stars, something occurs, which is a whole bunch of people whose worldview is, I don't go to Queens, have a problem, which is, I always eat at restaurants to get at least two stars in the New York Times. Conflict. A lot of those people went and tried this restaurant because it's now moving through the curve of the population and it has trust and authority because they found out about it from someone who they trusted. Okay? At that point, interesting thing happens. Zagatz has, at the front of the book, a ranking of the highest ranked restaurants. Well, Mrs. Shripify had picked a category that was almost empty. And she had 10,000 chowhounds on her side, plus a whole bunch of people who didn't know what good Thai food tasted like, but knew that the Times had given it two stars. So these groups of people ended up... Uh, giving her a huge rating. She was, for many years, one of the top five ranked restaurants in all of New York City at any price. Because this reporting system was in her favor. Does that make sense? Okay, so now she's moving through the curve, she's doubled the size, and then she's doubled the size again. So now she has 30, 40 tables, and it's busy all the time, except on Wednesdays. You know that I've been there on Wednesdays, and been broken hearted so she's moving through this curve now we can talk about the whole life thing which is she's also loving it she also loves being able to make uh, you know this cultural statement with her work etc but if we look at this as a business and compare it to the 40,000 other restaurants in New York City that weren't smart enough to do this you see what I'm talking about. She could have built it anywhere she wanted. She could have structured it anywhere she wanted. She could have priced it on the menu any way she wanted. She, you know, one of her competitors from Las Vegas opened one in a better location in Manhattan with white tablecloths at three times the price, and it failed. And the reason it failed wasn't because it was more expensive. It's because they, in, they didn't guess properly about how to tell the story and what would happen when people got there. That when you got there, it, the menu was too small, and it seemed too ordinary. So the chow hounds, we all raced there the first day, because this place in Las Vegas, some of us fly to Las Vegas just to eat there, and now it was in New York, and it disappointed us, because they were trying to go here, right away. They skipped the tribe leaders. They skipped the dues-paying process to work their way up as they were trying to do this. 
Does this all make sense? Yeah. How much of that would you say is deliberate? You know, I mean, how much of it is this is just the way you know, she cooks? This is her yeah. vision? You know, I think that she uh, had naive wisdom. Uh, so, you know, I've given her my books and we've talked a little bit about this. I think that most people would meet her and say that she's idiosyncratic. And sometimes idiosyncratic people end up failing because they're not in sync with the universe. She happened to be. So that when the Chahan showed up, she didn't shun the person for not being Thai. She would take 10 minutes to explain what Nam Prick is and why you want to dip your carrots in it, right? And so that was her instinct, but it happened to work. But I've also seen people who have done it on purpose, who people who, you know, you, you, you open a business that's supposed to be exclusive and even though it's empty in the back, you don't let, let people in, or you make them wait behind the velvet rope. Well, they like the velvet rope. That's why they're there. Or all these businesses that hire people to bring their friends the first couple weeks that it's open. You can hire a publicist to get celebrities to come. All of those things are all keying into that tiny group of 10,000 people is all you had to do to delight and then it worked its way through if you get the other pieces of it. Correct. What if you have different ideas and each of them has a different target market and the hardest part about what you do is picking what is it that you want to do and figure out what's the hardest part. Why do you think it's hard for you to pick? Because I have different interests that I want to do at the same time. No. Try again. Because I'm not committed to any of Why aren't you committing? Because I don't. I can't predict which one will work. Why is it important to you that you know which one will work? Um, I don't want to waste my time. And you don't want to fail. Yeah. That all of us have lots of interests, but we always figure out what to eat for lunch. Right? We don't say, "Well, I can't decide if I should have a sandwich or a pasta." Right? At some point, you have something to eat for lunch because the cost of failing is tiny. You will not be crushed because the pasta isn't as good as the sandwich would have been. You just eat something. So the posture, the dynamic is this. Picking nothing is guaranteed to not work. Picking something has to be better than that. So the discipline, and I speak from experience because when I was a book packager, we had a database with hundreds and hundreds of book ideas in it. How do you decide which book idea to pursue? How do you decide which one to spend a month on spec for? Well, the answer is it's always the, the bestseller is always a surprise. The you know the, the businesses that work always amaze the pundits. So given that no one knows, you just have to pick. And it, it's not about being right. It's just about being, about putting in the world, saying this is me, this is my business. Yeah. The problem is I started with three things I wanted to do at the same time. And that is not sustainable. Correct. Because I don't have, like, I'm not doing any of the three well enough just because I'm doing the Correct. So we're going to kill two, okay. and you're going to be stuck with one. Okay. And that's sad but true. Okay. So let's talk about the difference between the structure of your business and what your business does. So if you are peripatetic and you need to be constantly shifting from one thing to another, one ought to build a business that rewards that as opposed to saying, I have to be a massage therapist for eight hours a day. Right? The person who wants to be a massage therapist for eight hours a day doesn't worry about becoming bored with it. Right? On the other hand, Dick Cavett, right? his business was, I'm a talk show host, but every day there's a different person to talk to. It's less likely he's going to get bored if the business is going well, because there's someone interesting coming in tomorrow. So that is, when you think about, you know, for me, well, I had 70 people working for me. And what I discovered was I don't like having 70 people working for me. It was too much responsibility. I was taking care of too many people and it kept me from taking the risks that kept me out of bed in the morning. So I rebuilt my life so I have no people working for me. And as we do, they work for the company. I just bother them, right? But now it matches my personality. So if I want to make a record album one day and do a book three months later, I can. I'm still doing my job, which is this thing I'm doing right here. But I'm never going to do this event again. I'm never going to do it with you in this place. So this is a once-in-a-lifetime thing for me. And almost every day, I do a once-in-a-lifetime thing. There are other people 
who keep doing the same thing every single day because that's who they are. But this has nothing to do with your business strategy. It has to do with what do you want to do all day. Thank you for listening to The Startup School with Seth Godin. Listen to Episode 5 next week when Seth discusses why launching is overrated and how Kickstarter works. To learn more about Seth or to subscribe to his daily blog, please visit sethgodin.com. You can also find his books in any bookstore or on amazon.com. This has been an Earwolf Media production. Executive producers Jeff Ulrich and Scott Aukerman. For more information, visit Earwolf.com.